Hello, my name is Ava. On behalf of the church here at Northside, I'd like to welcome you and say that it is the great honor that you are here to worship with us today. I've been a part of this church my whole life and I can honestly say that Northside is a special place. I hope that'll be a special place for you as well. If you have any questions about the service or what's going on here at Northside, just click the link below. Thank you for joining us. It is great to see. I love the view from up here right at this time. I want to introduce you at this time to my dear sister, Michelle Young, uh, and her precious family, Jason, Jay, and Andrew. And they've been visiting here at Northside for a number of months now. And uh, Michelle and I have met on several occasions. And though she has been a believer uh, for most of her life, uh, yet uh, as they've been coming and and being more engaged in the Word of God and in the fellowship here at Northside. She said, I've just come under conviction that it's time to, for me to follow Christ in believers' baptism by immersion. So, Michelle, what is your thing today? Mission is Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Amen. And it's upon that confession that I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of His death, raised in the likeness of His resurrection. Good morning. As always, it is great to see everyone here, especially on a holiday weekend. Uh, what an incredible crowd. But thank you for choosing uh, to be here at this place, and especially our guests today. Uh, we are so thankful that you've chosen, uh, of all the places here in Murfreesboro, to be at Northside this morning. I'm going to say just a couple words and turn it over this morning. First of all, uh, today is designated as Religious Liberty Sunday on, the, on this year's SBC calendar. And with that said, we are so blessed to have with us Dr. Thomas Kidd and his precious wife, Ruby, uh, Dr. Kidd will be joining us in just a moment, but I'm so thankful, brother, for you to be here. Dr. Kidd is, is an author. He is a professor of church history at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary uh, in Missouri, though they live in, you know, it's right on the border there, um, but they do, and uh, such a blessing uh, to so many young people uh, as they begin their journey and understanding their calling, so we thank you for that ministry as well. He has two sons uh, that will both be at Dallas Baptist. Uh, here in just uh, about a month, uh, so he's going to be experiencing that. I know some of you are from that area as well or have gone there, so I thought I would share that. With that being said, months ago as I was preparing for today, realizing I was going to be between our series and began looking at this day and uh, wanting to tackle that subject of uh, a better understanding for us of what is patriotism versus naturalism, and, uh, excuse me, nationalism, and, and how do we keep our focus and our missiology focused on the fact that we're citizens of heaven, right? And that is our allegiance and our greatest citizenship. And so with that said, in doing some of my research, I came across an article and I thought, man, this is just great. This is on point. And I was faced with a dilemma. One of two things, either steal this man's uh, information, steal his work and share it as my own today, or invite him to come speak. And so I've chosen the latter of the two. Please help me welcome Dr. Kidd this morning.
Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that, that uh, kind introduction, and uh, it's, it's good to be here. I'm, I'm grateful for what the Lord's doing here at your church, and I, I do bring you greetings on behalf of Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, this morning, I want to think together with you, um, biblically and historically, about what it means for us as Christians to be proud of the good things about our nation here on 4th of July weekend, while also being crystal clear that our citizenship is in heaven. A couple of framing passages I want to give you to start off with is, one is uh, Philippians 3.20. Uh, we've already alluded to this passage in worship this morning, but Philippians 3.20 says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. And then uh, Psalm 33, a, a passage you often hear uh, quoted on Fourth of July weekend and, and other patriotic occasions. Uh, Psalm 33, 12 through 18. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth, he who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. I'm so thankful for the blessings that we enjoy as Americans. And you know, we believe as Christians that every good thing we have comes from the hand of God. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Uh, that, that uniquely applies to biblical Israel, and that's what it's talking about in, in Psalm 33. But it remains true that it is a blessing to be part of a nation that historically honored God's principles in many ways. Now, you all know I don't have to tell you that there is a long-standing debate about all kinds of issues related to America's Christian heritage, a debate over the extent to which America was founded as a Christian nation. And today, we hear constantly on the news and in social media, Facebook and so forth, that anyone who believes that Christianity and biblical morality has any public ramifications is a, quote, Christian nationalist. You know, we believe that it's a Christian nation, so Christian nationalist. And that doesn't sound very good, does it, being a Christian nationalist? But what does it actually mean? What does that actually mean to be a Christian nationalist versus a Christian patriot? You can certainly find examples of Christian nationalism in American politics and media today, uh, though I think not as often as critics would suggest. Uh, I would define uh, American Christian nationalism as the belief that, quote, the American nation is a central actor in the world historical purposes of God. I'll say it again. The, the American nation, a Christian nationalist believes, is, is a central actor in the world historical purposes of God. In other words, in the view of a Christian nationalist, to be fully Christian, you either have to be a patriotic American, or you at least have to believe that America is God's specially chosen nation, comparable only to biblical Israel in its spiritual significance. Well, I would say that that belief is problematic. Um, due to the reality that God, as you all know, has gathered people from every tongue, tribe, and nation to be in his eternal kingdom. And so as believers, 
as we've already said several times this morning, our eternal permanent citizenship is in heaven, not in any this worldly nation. So there's problems with Christian nationalism, but where does that leave Christian patriotism? How do we strike the right balance between wrong-headed nationalism on one hand and appropriate biblical patriotism on the other? Often this debate plays out in our arguments about the role that faith played in the American founding. And as I have tried to demonstrate in a number of my books, uh, faith principles and people of faith were everywhere in the American founding. They were all over the place. But some popular Christian advocates will go overboard when they tell us that the founding fathers were all born-again Christians, despite abundant evidence to the contrary. Uh, for example, Benjamin Franklin, uh, in his autobiography, tells us that he was a deist. <laughs> right, so that's a pretty good place to start. Was Benjamin Franklin a deist? He said he was in his autobiography. Okay, so not a born-again Christian. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, the subject of my most recent book, as you may know, composed his own radical version of the Gospels, uh, we call it the Jefferson Bible, by literally cutting out the miracles of Christ and literally cutting out the resurrection with scissors and pasting what was left into a blank book. I would have been afraid I would get blue bolted, right? <laughs> but, but that's what he did. That's what he did. Um, now, according to nationalist beliefs, um, the American founding would simply have to be Christian, and the founding fathers have to be Christian saints because the founding, we, the nationalists believe, is Christian, right? So, so the weight is put on the American founding more than Christian faith, and that we know is a real problem. Um, so if you get into that mindset of you, your assumption is that the founding is Christian, then we might be tempted to argue that even people like Franklin and Jefferson were born again believers, but doing that requires watering down the gospel. And that's not a price we should be willing to pay. Okay, so let's get down to specifics. What was the connection between faith and the American Revolutionary Era? Uh, to what extent did Christian beliefs, or at least belief in God, inform the American founding? It's a good weekend to talk about that. So let me, let me offer apologies from the outset. that This is not going to be a conventional exegetical sermon, uh, but more of a history lesson. Um, and, but there won't be a test at the end, I promise, but, but it's, this is a bit of a history lesson. I hope, I hope a mildly engaging history lesson, but a lesson nevertheless. Faith did play a critical role in the American founding. It did. And it's a role represented and illustrated by a, a favorite story of mine, um, one that occurred during Thomas Jefferson's presidency in the early 1800s. And, and this story illustrates how religious principles often united Americans in the founding, even people who had very different ideas about the gospel and about Jesus. On New Year's Day, 1802, the Baptist evangelist John Leland delivered a prodigious gift to the new president, Thomas Jefferson. That gift was a 1,235-pound block of cheese. I'm not kidding. Uh, they called it the mammoth cheese. <laughs> and the mammoth cheese came from John Leland's uh, farming community, milk cow farming community of Cheshire, Massachusetts which seems to have voted unanimously for Thomas Jefferson in the 1800 presidential election. And the cheese's red crust was adorned with the motto, 
Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Favorite saying of Thomas Jefferson's. Two days later, on Sunday, January 3rd, Leland, John Leland, del delivered an effusive sermon before members of Congress and President Jefferson. And a hostile Federalist congressman in attendance who did not like Thomas Jefferson or John Leland uh, wrote in his journal and called John Leland a, quote, cheesemonger <laughs> and a, quote, poor, ignorant, illiterate, clownish preacher. <laughs> <laughs> Leland, uh, for his part, spoke on the text, quote, Behold, a greater one than Solomon is here, with a not too subtle implication about his beloved president. And the embarrassed Federalist congressman, again writing in his journal, groaned that such a sermon, quote, Bald with stunning voice, horrid tone, frightful grimaces, and extravagant gestures was never heard by any decent auditory before. Well, to say that Jefferson and Leland made religious odd fellows is an understatement. Uh, John Leland had de devoted his life to saving souls as a Baptist evangelist, and he estimated at the end of his career that he had preached about 8,000 sermons. As an evangelical, John Leland simply confessed that, quote, my only hope of acceptance with God is in the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. Although he attended church regularly as president, Thomas Jefferson did not believe that the blood of Jesus would save him or anyone else. He always professed to be, quote, sincerely attached to Jesus's moral teachings but Jefferson did not believe that Jesus ever claimed to be the Son of God. He similarly thought that the doctrine of the Trinity was just nonsense. He called it the, quote, mere abracadabra of the priests of Jesus. What then led John Leland to admire Thomas Jefferson so much that he would think to give him that big cheese? Well, the answer to that question goes a long way toward explaining how religion helped to cement the new American nation. Although Jefferson and Leland could not have been more opposed in their personal religious views, they shared the same view of religious liberty and church and state. Indeed, many Baptists saw Thomas Jefferson as a sort of political savior. Dissenters, including especially the Baptists, had long suffered persecution in America, even after the patriots had fought for liberty in the American Revolution, some of them still persecuted the Baptists. Jefferson had long championed religious freedom in Virginia, where the itinerating John Leland had come to know and love the future president. So Jefferson the skeptic and Leland the fervent evangelical both believed that government should afford free exercise of religion to its citizens and not preference one Christian denomination over another. And these beliefs about religion and politics made fast friends of a skeptic and an evangelical. And to modern American eyes, this seems a most improbable alliance. Now, not all conservative Christians like Thomas Jefferson, to be sure, many hated him because they saw him as an infidel and a heretic. One called him a, quote, howling atheist. Uh, he was not an atheist, but that's what he got called. Uh, but these critics did not represent the wave of the future. Jefferson and Leland did. So the link between Jefferson and Leland shows that in the American founding, Deists and evangelicals and a range of Christians in between united around public religious principles that keyed the success of the American Revolution and helped to create our nation. Again, only public political beliefs united revolutionaries because personal faiths were already too diverse to join the wide range of believing and non-believing Americans. In 1776, America was already a nation of many religious views, and just like today, differing personal beliefs divided people. But in public, five 
religious ideas, I argue, connected far-flung and deeply varied religious Americans. And the first idea lay behind the mammoth cheese, and that was religious liberty, which the Southern Baptist Convention has marked today as a good day to celebrate the, the tradition of religious liberty, and it was awfully important in the American founding. Specifically, uh, the founders and especially groups like the Baptists agreed on the disestablishment of state churches. These official churches, just like the Church of England and Britain, received tax support and received legal protections. But those official churches often persecuted groups like the Baptists who were not established. You know, when the First Amendment talks about an establishment of religion. That's what we're talking about, is a tax-supported official denomination. Across America, Baptists led the charge against the religious establishments and for religious freedom. And they often gained critical assistance from liberal Christians or skeptics like Thomas Jefferson who shared their goals. Jefferson was also an architect of the second major point of agreement between deists and evangelicals in the founding, and that is the idea of the creator God as the guarantor of fundamental human rights. In older European traditions, kings and their defenders had often used Christian doctrine to uphold political hierarchy and defend the right of kings, but in America, revolutionaries began to appropriate the idea of common creation as the primary basis for the politi political liberties of all men. The most famous articulation of this idea, of course, came in Jefferson's Declaration of Independence adopted on July 4th, 1776, which proclaimed that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Even though Jefferson was skeptical about many biblical truths, when he needed a firm foundation for a plea for American rights, he turned to the broadly accepted notion of equality by creation. Now, to get into the detail, it is Fourth of July weekend, so let's look at the details here for a second of what he said in the Declaration of Independence. In this passage, Jefferson borrowed from his fellow Virginian, George Mason, and the recently drafted Virginia Declaration of Rights. And in that document, George Mason spoke of men as, quote, by nature, equally free and independent. By nature. It doesn't have the same oomph to it that Jefferson's did. So Jefferson rewrote this phrase to show more clearly the action of God in creation. All men are created equal. And Jefferson's next phrase, and are endowed by their creator, was also more theologically explicit than George Mason's wording, which had simply asserted that all men, quote, have certain inherent rights. Snore, right? <laughs> and, and Jefferson said, we need to be more direct than that. In a rough draft, Jefferson had been even more forthright, saying that, quote, from men's equal creation, they derive rights inherent and inalienable. So Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights did speak of God as creator, but only later in the document and with specific reference to religious liberty. Overall, Mason's phrasing just a month earlier was less theologically direct than what Jefferson used. So the use by Jefferson and the endorsement by Congress of equality and rights by creation twice in this essential sentence was no mistake or afterthought. Jefferson recognized that the wording of the Declaration of Independence would root his case for equality in the widely assumed common creation of humankind by God and thus provide a more transcendent basis for equality than merely referring to the rights of Englishmen or to nature or to reason. This was a profoundly significant example of the willingness of Jefferson and the founders to use religious theological concepts to mobilize Americans for the patriot cause. And as Jefferson famously explained later, 
He just meant the Declaration's language to reflect, quote, the harmonizing sentiments of the day, using language that would resonate with the American public and rise above sectarian differences in theology. By 1776, that concept of equality by God's creation had that kind of broad appeal, motivating appeal for the American public. But Jefferson, who was, of course, a Virginia aristocrat and a slave owner, only tentatively envisioned the Declaration as a catalyst of social change. But Americans quickly realized that his words about equality by creation could be used to stimulate a much deeper transformation in America. Indeed, the doctrine of the common creation of all people proved one of the most cogent arguments against slavery. Many American leaders tried to restrict God-given equality only to white men. However, some Americans took Jefferson's language of equal rights further than perhaps people like Jefferson intended. Within months, for example, of July 4th, 1776, the African-American evangelical pastor Lemuel Haynes had seized upon the Declaration's language of equality by creation and he cited Acts 17:26, which in the KJV reads, God has made of one blood all nations of men. To argue, Haynes said that, quote, liberty is as equally as precious to a black man as it is to a white one, and bondage equally as intolerable to the one as it is to the other. And Haynes warned that Americans invited the wrath of God if they did not give up chattel slavery. So the doctrine of rights guaranteed by God's common creation helped to make the ideological tensions over American slavery unsustainable. Beyond church-state relations and rights by creation, a wide spectrum of Americans also believed in the political threat posed by human Sinfulness, sinfulness. They worried about the sinfulness of the British, but they also worried about their own moral failings. In a 1776 proclamation for a day of prayer and fasting, the Continental Congress called on Americans to, quote, get a load of this, bewail our manifold sins and transgressions, and by a sincere repentance and amendment of life, appease God's righteous displeasure and through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, obtain his pardon and forgiveness. That's the American Congress in July 1776. Because of their doubts regarding human nature, the founders saw centralized government power as dangerous. The patriots rejected kings and any central consolidation of power because, as James Madison put it in the Federalist Papers, men are not angels. The founders' doubts about human nature took full bloom in the formation of the Constitution in 1787. James Madison knew well the doctrine of human depravity as he had attended Princeton College, which at the time was, believe it or not, an evangelical Presbyterian school. Some things have changed in the past few hundred years. But anyway, uh, although Madison believed that humans had a natural capacity for good, Madison nevertheless came to the Constitutional Convention in 1787 with a plan of government that would account for the reality of human sinfulness while also creating a government that was given enough power to act effectively against threats to the national interest. That, in some ways, is basically what they were trying to do in Philadelphia in 1787. Centralized government power kept the people at large from running wild and getting into all kinds of sin, but that political authority risked becoming tyrannical if it was not also balanced and checked within itself. A related moral principle, the counterpart to the belief in human sin, was the need for virtue, virtue to sustain the republic. If in America sovereignty was given over to the people, we the people, then those people must be willing to act benevolently with the public good in mind. 
George Washington encapsulated the priority of virtue in his 1796 farewell address. For him, virtue necessarily emerged from religious training and commitment. He said that, quote, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. This is Washington, 1796. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. And he said, let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded, he said, to the influence of refined education on the minds of peculiar structure, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. So Washington is saying no religion, no virtue. The final salient point of religious agreement in the revolution was the belief that God or providence moved in and through nations. With the onset of the revolutionary crisis, a major shift convinced Americans across the theological spectrum that God was using America for some special purpose. And this is a place where we get the closest to a belief in Christian nationalism among the founders. Americans widely enshrined the, pro the revolution with prophetic and providential significance. Uh, New England Baptist leaders, Isaac Backus and James Manning, for instance, believed that the revolution was, quote, an important step toward bringing in the glory of the latter day, the last days. While George Washington would not go as far as Backus and Manning, he nevertheless insisted that all Americans should see the hand of God in the war. Quote, the great author of the universe, Washington said, had intervened to ensure America's victory. During and after the revolution, many conflated America's political affairs and military affairs with divine purposes, which lent a redemptive aura to the war and to the fledgling nation. But I think providence could also mask morally complicated matters with the veil of divine approval. This is one of the risks of Christian nationalism. For example, on July 4th, 1779, a Sunday that fell on the third anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, Baptist pastor William Rogers addressed continental troops on their way to subdue Iroquois Indian raids against Patriot forces in New York. Rogers was an American chaplain through most of the war, and he reminded the men of their sacred cause. Quote, politically as a nation, we are exhorted to trust in the Lord, he said. American exertions have hitherto been crowned with success. Let us still under the banners of liberty and with a Washington for our head, go on from conquering to conquer. Quoting Psalm 22, he said, our fathers trusted and the Lord did deliver them. They cried unto him and were delivered. They trusted in him and were not confounded. Even so may it be with us for the sake of Christ Jesus who came to give freedom to the world. And with these words echoing in their minds, the troops attacked and burned 40 Iroquois towns during their campaign, raising their fields and orchards. So although providentialism united and inspired patriotic Americans during the war, it could also be the most morally problematic or ambivalent of all their shared religious principles can give you the idea that whatever America does is right because it's America. The devil was undoubtedly in the details of Americans' assertions of civil religion. Some founders, yes, envisioned America as a specifically Christian nation, while others preferred more general religious rhetoric about America. And these differing specifics would at times threaten to tear Americans apart, such as during the presidential election of 1800, which saw Thomas Jefferson defeat the sitting president, John Adams. Americans at the time could not agree on the religious significance of Thomas Jefferson's election. 
Uh, some Federalists who opposed Jefferson saw his victory as fraught with apocalyptic danger. The Gazette of the United States in Philadelphia, the nation's leading Federalist newspaper, repeatedly printed a notice in the fall of 1800 that instructed Americans to ask themselves, get a load of this, quote, shall I continue in allegiance to God and a religious president, meaning John Adams, or impiously declare for Jefferson and no God, right? And, and I love this. In the newspaper, the Jefferson and no God part were in all caps with triple exclamation points. They would have loved Twitter, right? And so, so they're saying, if you vote for Jefferson, you're voting for no God. We, they tell us politics are nasty today, but 1800 is just as nasty. Some Federalists reportedly hid their Bibles when they heard that Jefferson was elected, fearing that the government would uh, come and confiscate them. But other Americans... American Christians saw Jefferson's election in an entirely different light. The Danbury Baptist Association of Connecticut wrote to Jefferson in 1801 congratulating him on the election. Quote, we have reason to believe the Baptists exalted that America's God has raised you up to fill the chair of state out of that goodwill which he bears to the millions which you preside over. So for many Baptists and other Jeffersonian evangelicals, Jefferson's election represented a great victory for religious liberty. Jefferson didn't show much sign as president of what his, some of his fans today call a strict separationist approach to church-state relations. As we just saw, he had John Leland preach in a church service basically in the House of Representatives. He regularly uh, approved and attended uh, church services in, in virtually all federal government buildings at the time. Uh, so uh, Jefferson is uh, no champion of this kind of rigid church-state separation. He definitely believes in religious liberty, and that's why the Baptists love him. Um, so Jefferson uh, and the Baptists uh, definitely believed in religious liberty. They did not want an established church, but neither of the, them would have entertained the notion that religion should have no place in the political life of the republic. Their experience with church-state relations told them that great danger lay in government creating religious establishments, as I said, tax-supported churches, and preventing the free exercise of religion. But they've hardly envisioned a secular republic, and such a notion would have been incomprehensible in the middle, middle world of the founding. Now, this is not to suggest, you've got to hang in there with Jefferson. This is not to suggest that Jefferson secretly held some kind of traditional faith, Christian faith. He didn't. Jefferson's victory simply revealed that the founders' commitment to a republic where religion would be free and would sustain public virtue remained in place after Jefferson's election. Now, it would be an overstatement, as I've already suggested, that, to say that for all Americans in 1776, the Lord was their God, in the, in the words of Psalm 33. But many Bible-believing Christians were involved with the founding, and the great principles of the founding, especially religious liberty and equality by creation, were based on principles of faith. And really, to apply this somewhat, we, we find the greatest blessing when we sync up our lives and the life of our nation with God's principles. Um, now, there's only so much that we can do today about syncing up the life of our nation with God's principles. Obviously, in some ways, it has departed from those principles. But one of the very best things we can do on the 4th of July is to remember the principle of Psalm 21.1 which is that the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. And so if we actually believe that, that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and we do care for our nation, then the first and best thing we should do as patriotic Christians on the 4th of July is to pray. First and best thing. First uh, Timothy 2 likewise commands that, quote, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. 
So whatever else you do as a Christian for the 4th of July, you should pray for that. Now, there may be some of you here who are thinking, look, Dr. Kidd, I'm a patriotic American, I'm a Christian, I'm proud of it. Like, what else is there to say? Well, this is maybe the place where believing in a very smooth fit between being an American and being a Christian can be the most dangerous spiritually. Um, Yes, as we have seen this morning, America has deep Christian influences, you bet. But that fact does not make you a born-again believer. Just because you live here and are proud to be an American. I speak about this from personal experience. Uh, For most of my life, until I was 18 years old, I would have told people that I was a proud American and a Christian, and I didn't see much difference between the two. And that's because I did not understand the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ. I figured I was automatically counted as a citizen of heaven because I was a citizen of the USA. I was wrong, Um, and I did not know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If something doesn't change in our natural trajectory, we are all headed for eternal condemnation by God. Every single person here, think about this, every single person here is going to face the judgment of God when we die. And when we do, being an American isn't going to do anything for us. So the question is, are your sins forgiven? Or are they not forgiven? For people of every nation, every nation, Christ is the only hope for salvation. He died on the cross to pay the penalty of sin for all who would turn to him in faith. He rose from the dead to defeat the power of sin, death, hell, and the devil. So when we put our faith in him to save us and to be our Lord, we will experience a new birth of salvation. So this is as good a Sunday as any. If you're not sure about your standing with God, I'd encourage you to talk to Pastor Bramble or me or a Christian believer that you trust, that you've come with, Don't put it off any longer. As Abraham Lincoln reportedly said when he, he when asked if he thought God was on the side of the Union in the Civil War, he said, quote, Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My great concern is to be on God's side. May that be true of our nation, and may it be true for you and your family as well. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for the blessings that we have as Americans. We're grateful for our tradition of religious liberty, for the freedoms that we have that so many believers in the world today, this morning, do not have. We're thankful for the great principle that we are equal because you created us in your image. And we do pray in accord with 1 Timothy 2. We pray for those in authority over us, and we thank you for them. We pray for our president. We pray for the Supreme Court. We pray for our senators and representatives. We pray for our governor. We pray for state legislators. We pray for our city leaders. We pray that they would lead with godly wisdom, even sometimes in spite of themselves, so that your people, the church, may be free to live quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and reverence. And Lord, if anyone here does not know for sure that their citizenship is secure in heaven and that their sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ, I pray that you would move powerfully in their hearts, even right now, and they would get this issue settled today. Thank you, Lord, for your enduring kindness and grace to us in Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below.